we're going back to the theology on tap. Now, just before I introduce our guest speaker tonight, if we can just have a, bit, a few moments of silence and I'll start off in prayer. With the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Jesus, we thank you for bringing us all here tonight, especially our friend and um, guest from the States, Sharif. We thank you for the gift of the last few popes who've um, really given us young people so much inspiration and zeal from the experiences of worldly the graces which can work in our lives even if we're not physically present at it, but if we're united in prayer and charity with the, the pilgrims there. We ask that you keep the Holy Father, all the cardinals, the bishops, the priests, and the young people safe as they make their journeys home. And we ask for the grace to help us and the theme of all the day to go and make disciples of all nations. And as Pope Francis said in closing mass, to do so without fear and uh, always in the heart of service. And so we call an intercession uh, of our lady, Hail Mary, full of grace. All right, now it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker tonight. I was lucky enough to meet Sharif Gerges uh, when I was working over in New York City a number of years ago. We soon became friends. I think Skype has helped a little bit since then, but Sharif has spent a lot of his time recently on the issue of same-sex marriage, and obviously a very big one in the States right now at the Supreme Court, which is recently. And it's big over here in Australia, uh, at the state level as well. Now, his work on same-sex marriage came to particular prominence back in 2010 when he published an article called What is Marriage uh, in the Harvard Journal of Foreign Public Policy, which soon became the most downloaded article on a major social science uh, research website, SSRN. And this sort of article became viral and soon led him and his co-authors, uh, Professor Robert George from Princeton and Ryan Anderson from Notre Dame, uh, to expand that into a book, What is Marriage, which Jesse from Mustard Seed has graciously got a stand on here. We've got all the books available at the front. It's a little plug there, um, and they'll be available for purchase throughout the evening, and Sharif, I'm sure, will be happy to sign copies of that if he does. But uh, far from being able to pigeonhole Sharif into one category like same-sex marriage, he's been involved quite extensively, actually, in a lot of major, controversial, hot-button sort of issues uh, in the States and then around the world where he's lectured on uh, many different occasions. There is moral, political, legal philosophy, sexual ethics, early end of life issues, bioethics. You can think of it. Now, many of you here would be students, and Sharif himself is also a student at the moment. Right now he's a PhD student in philosophy at Princeton. He's a Juris Doctorate candidate at the Yale Law School as well. After he graduated in uh, Phi Beta Kappa and Summa Cum Laude from Princeton, where he won prizes for the best senior thesis in ethics and the best thesis in philosophy, as well as the Dante Society of America's National Dante Prize, he obtained a big field in moral, political, and legal philosophy from the University of Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. So all of this uh, goes to say, basically, Sharif you know, struggles a little bit intellectually. Uh, so give him a fair go tonight, uh, cut him some slack, uh, but he also needs a little bit of slack because he hasn't quite adjusted to Aussie lingo yet. He might be a little bit jet lagged. So try to steer clear of saying things like thongs, uh, Barbies, or brothers around him. He might make him a little bit scandalised. Uh, now he's uh, he's pretty used to Australia. He's been here about eight or nine years ago. Um, and he enjoyed his trip then, so hopefully he'll enjoy his time here tonight. But it's a great pleasure to have him here. For what's actually his only sort of big public lecture while he's here in his visit. Uh, and he's been sharing tonight with us some really practical insights on how to engage hot topics, um, the most controversial ones that we're always coming up against in the public square. So it's a great pleasure to have him, and please give him a warm Aussie welcome. Sure it goes. Great. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, and thanks, everybody, of course, for coming. Uh, I, as he said, I enjoyed my trip to Australia last night very much. And this time is measuring up just as well. I'm going to give some general tips about how to have these difficult conversations on moral issues 
And here and there I'll be using examples from the life issues or marriage debate. Um, but I'm happy during Q&A to go into specific or substantive stuff on any of those issues, as well as more into these kind of more method points. And the other thing is I'll start with kind of the more mundane and simple kind of style, um, aspects of style, and then I'll talk a little bit about kind of strat general strategies of substance, and then I'll end with some of the things that I think a spiritual perspective or a Catholic perspective should add to the way we conduct these debates. I think in general the most important thing about any of them is your tone and your style of delivery. And the easy way to see this is that if you think back to the last big brawl you had on any one of these issues uh, that happened more than a week ago, on marriage, on life, on what religious liberty should mean concretely on any of those things, you probably can't remember more than one or two substantive points that the other person said. Maybe one or two things stuck in your mind, but for the most part, what most people remember from most of these conversations is the way they were conducted. So I think in terms of having an effect of planting a seed, whatever metaphor you want to use, the tone is the most important thing. And on these issues in particular, I think the two things you want to have most are cheer and confidence. The on, on all of these moral issues or social issues, after all, if you believe in these views, you believe that they're good for people and that they're good for society. And everything about your delivery and your tone and your content should reflect that. Um, and I think from there you get a, an immediate change in the way that your listener will be treating your argument. And I've seen this personally in debates and lectures um, all around the United States where for the most part I speak at law schools or philosophy departments where everyone is hostile. And I'll have 60 minutes of Q&A without a single friendly question. And in, in the lead up to those things, I usually get a lot of worried messages from my hosts. People will say, well, like, I'm really worried about this. On Facebook, there have been lots of plans to protest your talk. Um, people are planning to glitter bomb you. People are planning to uh, moon you. I've, everything has been threatened. And they talk about having security guards ready for me. And I, you know, it's, it's a usual thing, so I sort of deal with it. And then the only thing I do differently is in the first five minutes, I establish that I'm happy to be there, that I'm pretty confident I've got an argument they haven't thought seriously about, and that I welcome their objections, because I think that their view on balance is wrong. And that changes everything. And you can tell when you walk up to the podium, the people in the audience who are going to be most hostile, because they're sort of sitting there with a sort of sideways posture and a smirk. And they're just waiting for you to embarrass yourself. Uh, and, and immediately, with that change of tone on your part, there's a change of posture and presentation on theirs. And the, the line between dismissal and curious interest is, as it turns out, a very fine one. I had um, a nice example of this when I was, I was actually at, well, in, in a law school class once, and it was in the middle of class, so we had a break. And one of my classmates, very sweet girl, a good friend of mine now, but at the time, we, were, we had just started, so we didn't really know each other. She said, I saw that you missed class on Thursday. And I said, yeah. And she said, um, well, what were you doing? And I thought for a second, should I dodge it? Should I be, you know, should I fudge it? And I said, no. Well, I said, well, I was at a debate. She said, oh, about what? I said, marriage. And she said, what about marriage? I said, well, it was about same-sex marriage. And she said, in that way, that's completely expecting one answer, but just doing it for the sake of forms, it was, what side were you on? I said, I was against. And her face changed. She paused. And she searched. And then she thought of something. She said, oh, was it one of those debates where you go and they just assign you a position? <laughs> I had to say no. So I said no. And it was remarkable. Immediately, there was a shift in her tone. It wasn't one of, oh gosh, we're all on the same side. We're all on the right side of history. This is Yale Law School. It was, 
and what did you say? And what was the argument? And could you send me the article? And that began um, a much longer discussion that eventually flourished into a reading group and, and a good friendship. And that would have gone completely differently if I had gone with my initial temptation to fudge it or to admit it, but then apologize and explain that I have like 14 gay friends and that I understand they're even on the other side and so on. If I had played to type or to their impression of my type, which is one of kind of insecure concern and, and worry that I myself am what they say I am, that I'm a bigot, or that I just haven't thought through the issues. Confidence is another thing you have to have, and I think, I personally am, it's hard for people to buy this at this point, but it's completely true, I'm deeply averse to conflict. I hate it. Uh, well, I spent the first two years of college or uni um, trying to avoid it at all costs. I remember once having someone in my dorm room and we were talking about something and somehow got on a social issue and I just drove him out of the room rather than have the conversation. And the reason was a lack of confidence. I was worried that anything I said was something they would have thought of already and that they would have thought of an objection to. And so I didn't want to go through the embarrassment. Really, I didn't want to take the risk of making an argument. Obviously, I took some steps to overcome that. And uh, I still struggle with it sometimes. But I think one thing I've learned is that for the most part, neither of those things is true. Most people have never heard a good argument about any view that they would be immediately dismissive of. And especially when we're talking about defending unpopular, moral, and social teachings of the church. Most people have not heard the argument and rejected it, but have just never heard it. They think they've heard it. And that can take you a long way in itself. It's a huge opportunity, even just to inform people, to make sure that their objections, if they're going to have them, are the right ones. Another thing I think it's important to have is honesty. Sometimes when we are defending something that we think is true, and not just true, but kind of part of the faith, we feel this obligation to, to show or to believe that every single point anyone could bring up is actually a point in our favor, and that there are no real points against. And that's not true. It's not the case. Sometimes, for example, people talk about the pro-life issue as if it's never really true that a child can be a real burden on someone's life. I think we have to admit all the things that are true because we have nothing to fear from them. If what we're defending is true on balance, then the argument will remain intact. And admitting the hardships that a particular moral principle is going to impose is no argument against that principle because it's true of every moral principle. At the edges, every moral requirement is going to impose some hardships, and it's going to impose different ones on different people. And that's no argument against it. Admitting the weaknesses, admitting the difficulties of a particular view is also a good way to build credibility with the other person. And that's crucial for debates in which um, credibility is very difficult to establish. Because one of the things at stake is whether the other person is a person of goodwill. Another thing is to be proactive. I mean, the real answer, the very short answer to the title question, on under the how to engage without losing, is just to know the arguments as well as you can. And in particular, again, on issues where you're going to be defending an unpopular view, to know the other person's view better than they do. I always have it as a goal to be able to put the other person's objections much more powerfully than they can before answering them. And the, the way to do that, there's no substitute to just getting informed. And getting informed usually means looking at the most advanced form of that debate that you can have access to. Um, I sometimes contribute to an online journal called Public Discourse, which I think is especially good for giving the kind of state-of-the-art arguments and, and answers to objections on a lot of the social issues that are kind of in the vicinity of our discussion today marriage, religious liberty, life issues, uh, and so on. And I think there's no substitute, as I say, to reading that stuff, to finding out where the smartest people on both sides have duped it out, and to getting a lay of the land from those arguments. 
The more of the landscape you feel that you know going into a discussion, the less you're going to be defensive in a way that can make you hot under the collar, in a way that can make you panic and cover up that panic with uh, just being very combative or with being, giving in to the temptation um, to throw zingers and insults and other kinds of distractions from the issues. And if there's no substitute to reading up on the best arguments on both sides, there's also no substitute to practice. I mean, the, the thing that eventually got me over my fear of confrontation or, or conflict over these things was uh, not a magic formula, it was just having the conversations over and over and over again. And being willing to have them, have them first of all, with friends who agree with you, who can help you see weaknesses as an argument. Have them with friends who disagree with you, who are going to have the goodwill and the decency to share um, where they think you're going wrong, but without uh, making you feel small for it. There's no substitute for that. So those are a couple of the things that I try to keep in mind when I'm going into a conversation like this, just in terms of style and presentation and general method. There are a couple points of strategy in terms of substance that tend to apply across all, all of these issues. And the first, and well, most of them actually flow from the same point I was making earlier, that you're going to be defending a view that's on the one hand traditional, but on the other hand unpopular. And that creates certain common disadvantages that you have to get over, whatever the particular issue is. One of those disadvantages is a double standard. People will regularly make bad arguments against a view that fits that description. And by a bad argument, I mean an argument that would just as much apply to something they believe. But they don't see that because nobody makes the point to them because their view is the more popular view. It's the view that doesn't have to be tested in the conversation. To give you a couple examples, think of all of the most common arguments you hear for changing marriage laws to recognize same-sex relationships. We don't want to stigmatize people. We want to give them the same access to certain economic benefits. If people decide to have a relationship with another man or another woman, we don't want their relationship to be stigmatized. We also don't want their children to be stigmatized for growing up in a household that doesn't get recognition. All of these arguments would apply equally to someone who personally found the most fulfillment in a multiple person bond. And this isn't just a kind of sci-fi hypothetical, at least in the United States, and I think in other Western countries, increasingly there's advocacy for this. Not polygamy in, this, in the kind of traditional sense of one man, several women, where there are problems of gender equality, but multiple partner unions, polyamory, where people find the most personal fulfillment, or report finding it, in a multiple person bond with the uh, overcoming of jealousy and the variety and the outlets that that provides, where they say they find it more stable. By their own lights, to say that they should settle for monogamy is like saying that they should settle for someone they're not attracted to. All of the arguments would apply equally to that kind of union, and yet most people, most rank and file folks who support same sex marriage would not support that change. And once you present that fact to them, it just has the effect of clearing out the bad arguments, of taking out the double standard that they're typically applying to your view because it happens to be less popular. And then you can start over. And you can say, well, what are the arguments specific to this? What are the objections to my view that are specific to my view that wouldn't equally tell against your own? I think the same thing is true of abortion in a big way. When people talk about the reasons we should have abortion, what do they cite? They cite economic concerns, are you really wanting to condemn a woman to a life of poverty, uh, health concerns, concerns about social well-being, quality of life, population control in some cases. But of course, all of those concerns could be equally served by, I mean, if, if killing people were a permissible solution, uh, permissible means to any of those goals. That would equally be true of, say, eliminating the bottom 1% of the socioeconomic ladder, 
or of a city's most destitute or poorest or homeless people. You could make an argument for social hygiene, for a kind of health benefit, for economic benefits. You know, this is this is the population in the in the society, in the city, in the municipality that's costing taxpayers the most. Every one of those arguments could be made in that context, and when we make them in that context, they sound grotesque. And the reason they do is that when nobody actually thinks that killing people is a permissible means to any of those goals. And once you make that simple point, it doesn't mean that the other person's going to come around on abortion. It means that they're going to stop making bad arguments for abortion access. And they're going to realize that there is a central question they have to answer first, and everything hinges on that. And that is, is this entity in the room a person with rights or not? If it is a person with rights, then it doesn't matter what economic or health or social benefits we're going to get out of allowing its death. And if it isn't, then of course all that stuff is welcome, but you don't even have to cite it to make that point. Everything hinges on that. And making that simple point again would just clear out the bad arguments, take out the, the double standard that they're applying to your argument. In other words, people will make bad arguments where they can. And they can where their view is more popular, unless you call them out on Another thing is that people often set up different tasks for you as opposed to them when you have the less popular view. Um, and the most common form this takes is that people with the traditional but less popular view are often having to defend the whole picture. You have a whole theory to defend from scratch, whereas all they have to do is poke a hole in it. And of course, it's much more difficult to do the first thing than to do the second thing. Take the marriage issue. Most people will not give you a ground up defense of their own view of which relationships count as a marriage, of why the state's involved in it, why the state should recognize those and not others. They'll just say, what is it with you and these same-sex relationships? Why are you so against them? But if you get people first to say what they think marriage is, and why they think it should be limited to romantic unions, and two-person romantic unions, and permanently and exclusively committed two-person romantic unions, and ones between unrelated people. And you ask them each of those restrictions, where do they come from, why, what sense do they make, and why are they okay without violating anybody's equality? Then you get them in the position to hear your own argument. Because you get them, first of all, to see how difficult it is to make a ground-up defense of a whole view. Second, you get them in the mindset where they're already, again, avoiding the bad arguments that just because there's an excluded relationship, it's a violation of someone's equality. Because they realize they're excluding as well. And then you get them to see the kinds of reasons that could possibly count for which relationship should be included. You get them to see also whether their view or your view can make better sense of those other features of marriage that you both agree on. So in general, I think, making sure that the same task is being performed on both sides of the debate is really important. If you have to defend a whole view, they have to defend a whole view. Another thing I think that's very, um, that's a good example of this really is the life issue. I mean, and that's maybe the easiest place to see this. If the debate starts out and the whole burden is for you to explain why abortion should not be allowed in cases of rape. Obviously, it's going to be a difficult debate. If, on the other hand, you start out the debate by laying out everybody's cards on the table, you say what you think the law should be on abortion, or whether you think every life should be protected from conception on, and they say what restrictions they think should apply. Why, where should we draw the line, and why should we draw it there? As soon as people are even just forced to say something in response to that, they're already in the mindset where they're going to be more open to your own arguments, which will be more coherent once the whole groundwork is exposed. Another thing that happens when you're defending a more traditional view is that inevitably you're going to go on the defensive because it's traditional, it's received, you feel like it's this whole big thing to defend, and it's less popular, so you're gonna feel more besieged. And every opportunity you can find to turn that dynamic around is going to be one worth 
take, I mean, if you are spending a whole conversation explaining why you're not a bigot, something has gone wrong. And that should be pretty obvious. Um, so I always like to start with what I think are the weakest points in my opponent's view. Start with those. And then I give the positive reasons for my own view, and then I address the objections to that view. And that's the form that the book takes. Um, we try to start out with saying what we think the internal contradictions in the pro-same-sex marriage view are. That it makes marriage a matter of emotional union, but it restricts that emotional union, but it, but it excludes lots of things that have emotional connection, like multiple personal bonds, like non-sexual bonds, and so on. Uh, things like that. And then we say, well, given the failure of that view to explain permanence or exclusivity or monogamy or the idea that marriage is a sexual relationship at all, here's a view that can make sense of all of those things. It can give them unity and coherence. And then, having seen the problems with the other side and the way with, that this view explains and exceeds those problems, then you can go to the objections that are specific to your view and show why they don't, um, why they don't defeat it. That's a way of, again, not being on the defensive, which there's no reason you should be when the conversation is not just a general social dynamic, but one-to-one. -one. Another thing is that sometimes people's most powerful objections, most effective objections to the culture, to the church's views, actually apply to their own. Think about the marriage debate. Most people at a gut level just think that the church's view is inhumane, that it's harmful to people, and that that's the main problem. I actually think there are a lot of ways in which the dominant view of marriage behind the push for same-sex marriage is itself quite harmful, that it takes a toll on real human lives. Here's just two simple ways. In general, I think, and I argue in the book that that view of marriage sees marriage mainly as a matter of degree. It sees it as the most intense form of emotional connection. That marriage has the most of whatever makes any relationship valuable, shared emotions and experience. And that has two of what I think are quite harmful social effects. One of them is to say that if you don't have a certain kind of intense emotional connection, it's inauthentic to keep going with the marriage. And the practical result of that is something like no-fault divorce, which in the United States we have long and well-established evidence created great harms for society, especially for women and for children. Uh, women were the ones who were supposed to be the best beneficiaries of no-fault divorce, and it turns out that in most cases, they're the ones who economically and socially um, get um, the short end of the stick. And then children who, in most of the relationships that end up being uh, broken off because of no-fault divorce's wide availability, would have done better with their own mother and father. These are real people, real lives, that are hurt by what seems on its face a very positive vision of marriage. Another thing I think that's a casualty of this idea of marriage is friendship. And as a result of that, people who, for whatever reason, remain single. If you see marriage as the max of social achievement, of closeness, of intimacy, the best and in some ways only real answer to loneliness, then you're going to think that it's inappropriate to have an emotional connection outside of marriage. You're going to think that friendship is mainly just a kind of outlet. It's mainly a pit stop on the way to the thing that really counts which is marriage, which is the most. And that single people who are single for whatever reason are just going to have to settle for less, for loneliness. I think that's a deeply harmful view. But it's just the flip side of a view that sounds on its face quite positive and that in our culture has been depicted as much more humane than the stodgy traditionalism, which thinks that marriage has a more specific shape oriented to family life, which is a result of that sees a really wide horizon of possibilities for being close to other people in different ways, for finding deep spiritual and emotional fulfillment in other connections. So sometimes you can take the most powerful objection and flip it. And that, of course, is one way of being 
on the offense. I think another thing that's probably quite obvious but that we don't do enough is just to start with common ground. If you're really starting with the less popular view, then you have to start with something that's widely accepted and then try to work your way to showing that it implies your own view. Um, take the church's teachings on uh, sex outside of marriage. Most people think that that's kind of, or at least the dominant view in our culture is that that's a crazy idea that you can't possibly explain why anything but consent should matter. And yet, if you press, most people don't think that consent is the only thing that matters. And they have a view that tries to find a stable middle ground, but that isn't really stable at all. Most people think that you should restrict sexual relationships to contexts where you have deep commitment and love. Most people think that casual sex is worse than other, form, than other activities with someone you're not committed to, tennis or something. Casual sex is worse than casual tennis, right? And at first, you know, you laugh because it's so obvious, but if you press people to explain why that could be, if consent is all that matters, if people should be free to do whatever they want, what is damaging about casual sex? And why should the line be drawn at commitment, but not greater commitment? People usually start to wax pretty eloquent and pretty romantic at this point and say, well, sex is a way of giving your whole self to someone, of revealing your whole self to someone. Then that raises the natural question, well, why shouldn't you have a total commitment to match that total offering of yourself? You can start with points that are of common ground and push people to see how it moves in the direction of much less common ground, much less popular um, views. Or the idea in the, in the life context that, you know, most people think that our basic rights are had equally. That our basic rights don't depend on what we can do. They depend on what we are, which is human beings. And yet, there are arguments for why the fetus doesn't have moral status will be about what fetus can do or not do. Can't feel pain or feels pain less or it can't think of itself as being over time. It doesn't have conceptual thought. It doesn't have consciousness. So why should what you can do as opposed to what you are matter before birth but the opposite be true after birth? Right? You can start again with common ground like the basic equality of all human beings and then say that means that our value can't depend on something that we have unequally, like intelligence or sensitivity. Okay, but the, the most general point of strategy I have is really maybe a disappointing one, because it suggests that the kinds of conversations in which you might be hot under the collar are pretty useless by and large. And that is that the best context for an actually effective or persuasive argument is friendship. But on the other hand, that means that when we do have a one-off debate with someone, I think the best way to frame it is to think, what would you do, how would you conduct that conversation if your goal was to get them to come around on the issue within a year? Right? So not there, not right on the spot, but within a year. And one reason that I suggest that is that it's almost never happened. I mean, first, I've been doing debates and arguments somehow as a kind of occupation, either through studying philosophy or through having these conversations on social issues, for something like seven years. And only once, and in really unusual circumstances, did somebody change their mind right on the spot. But I've had lots of people write in, or shoot an email to me, or send me a Facebook message, a couple months, a couple weeks, sometimes a couple years after a conversation or a cluster of conversations. So, you know, I thought about something, and then what you said kind of stuck with me, and then I researched this, and I looked into that. And, and the other thing is that much more often, people are the most receptive, the most motivated to listen within the context uh, of friendship. And I think, you know, if, you're, if that's your goal, if you're thinking on a one-year horizon, you know, it's pretty obvious that some things will be different. You're going to plant seeds of doubt but you're not going to demand an answer right there. One reason, again, is that they just almost never happen. 
But it almost never happens for good reason. I mean, one thing is people realize that the fact that they don't have an immediate answer to a point doesn't mean there isn't one. So they want to go look. And you should respect that. And the other thing is a kind of matter of dignity. There's something really humbling about saying, I was wrong about this or that. We've all experienced that. Because we've all been wrong, we've all had to say that. And I think it's a matter of basic respect to leave people the liberty and the space to do that on their own schedule and without an audience. And in a context and in a way where making that move will not be seen by you or by them as a matter of personal defeat in any sense. And that, in turn, is going to shape how the conversation goes. You're going to resist the urge to make the really good zinger that would be hilarious, really sarcastic, really biting, but that would make it that much less likely that they would feel that space and freedom to come around. You'd be planting seeds in the long term. You'd be showing them you know, what you think is a difficulty or a problem for their view, but you're not going to be doing anything that you think could have any chance of embarrassing them. You'll be wanting to build credibility and trust because you'll be wanting them to come back around to you. If this is a year-long project, it's not going to happen all at once. You want them to have the freedom to come back around to the issue without feeling like you're going to raise your voice or try to humiliate them. And you're going to want to motivate them. I mean, very often I've had the experience of having a conversation that gets started because of whatever circumstance, and getting people to see the problems with their own view, and getting them to see the arguments for another view, and then it just stops, just peters out. And the main reason is not that they, they think they've got a really good comeback to an objection, or that they think they have a decisive objection for my view, just that they don't care. Motivation is a huge aspect of these discussions and these debates, and motivation is much more likely to come over the long haul, where you, where you have time and space to show people why a particular issue matters, or how it affects your life day to day, that you believe in this or that. And that's the kind of thing, again, that can happen best in the context of a friendship. But one thing that a friendship requires is a kind of genuine, and in that sense, unconditional love. So I think another thing that's really important is that you're going to be most effective in the context where the other person doesn't think that anything is riding on whether they come around. You love them, you're going to be there for them, and you're going to enjoy all the other aspects of friendship, whether or not they change their mind on this particular issue. Because that's going to be a signal to them that you actually care, as opposed to just sort of instrumentalizing them, seeing them as another notch in your like, rhetorical belt. And it's also going to be the context in which they trust you. And trust is so important because, look, we've got, we're all familiar with the problems with thinking through these issues, right? There's all kinds of confirmation bias. You know, if you start out with one view, you're going to be likely to notice the evidence that supports it and to ignore the evidence that goes against it. You're going to have, be motivated against anything that might require you to change it because that's a difficult and costly process, personally. Friendship provides the context and the motivations to overcome all of those things. If somebody's your friend, they want to see the point and value of what you're saying. They want to interpret it in the best light possible. They like you. They want to believe that you're basically good and intelligent and have interesting things to say. And so all of those things are going to be corrected, but only in the context of a genuine and genuinely felt friendship. It's also the context in which ego is smallest, right? People feel the least like it's going to be a personal defeat. I mean, it, friendship is a matter of being shoulder to shoulder, seeking some good together. And in the best case, you really feel like your friend's game is your own as a result of that. And so the kind of antagonism that makes it a zero-sum game of dignity for somebody to admit defeat or to uh, admit being wrong is going to be least in friendship, where every game is just kind of like something we achieved together. Now, obviously, the opposite of friendship is Facebook. And I think that that produces one of my other personal rules, at least, which is that I almost never have 
these debates on Facebook. For a while, I made the mistake of posting some of the things I write on Facebook. Maybe it's not a mistake if I, if I had the willpower to ignore the comments that were posted. But think about all the things we just talked about, like the motivation and the context and the space to really think through an issue, to read your friend charitably, the, the lack of an audience that makes ego at stake. All of that is directly assaulted by the context of Facebook. So I think that if, I'll at least say this, if your goal is to persuade the person you're actually having the conversation with, Facebook is the wrong way to do it. You might have other goals to talk past them and, and reach the people who are reading these comments or to help out your friend who's like really, you know, 500 comments down is really starting to lose the game. But, <laughs> And that's fine, and that can be valuable, and maybe you're called to that and you have to offer it up. And, you know. I just think it's the least likely context for persuasion. Okay, so what does the spiritual perspective add to any of this? So far, all of this stuff, like a noble pagan could have bought into, right? Okay, it's true, not winning, and you, know, it's, you don't want to be sophistical about it. But what does our faith add? Well, the first thing is I think it gives you supernatural means. Uh, this is the most obvious point, but I think it's the point we often tend to neglect. You have supernatural means in the sense that you have more means and less means at your disposal. More means because you've got prayer and fasting. And I think both of those are really important. You know, if, you're having, if you're really having one of these serious conversations, it's going to be with a friend. If it's a friend, it's someone who's good, you care about. If you're not praying for the good of someone you care about. Some things of this, right? And so, prayer is important, and by fasting, I just mean in general, little mortifications to offer up for the sake of, the intention of, you know, a friend and, and bringing them closer to the truth. But you also have fewer means, in the sense that there are some tactics that are off limits to us if we really buy into the whole Catholic thing, right? And in particular, all that stuff about turning the other cheek, I think is most important for this context. Because usually, any kind of insult, anything that you might turn your cheek from is, is going to be a zinger. It's going to be just the kind of stuff that brings in the ego and the audience and all the other things that make persuasion impossible. So this is the context in which however good your rhetorical skills get, however perfect the sh and Shakespearean your insult is for your uh, the person you're having a conversation with, you've got to resist. And I've more than once had to draft and redraft an email <laughs> to live more by that rule. And as a result, I just, you know, I think it's, it's an opportunity to offer up the, the pain of not looking that good rhetorically um, for the sake of your friend. So you have supernatural means, which means both more and fewer means. You also have a supernatural spirit about it. Now by this I mean, first, a kind of fearlessness. You know, some of these debates will turn in certain ways on historical or scientific issues, right? So sometimes it's a historical challenge to the accuracy of the Gospels. Like, these are completely unreliable documents, and we know that because there was never this Palestinian carpenter in the first place, you know, historians have proved it, and, you know. and those kinds of arguments, however outlandish they might be, can only be answered by history. By more historical, if they're historical objections, they have to be answered by historical arguments. If they're scientific objections about, uh, you know, it turns out that you can't possibly believe in physics and also believe in miracles or something. You have to show why, by the rules of science itself, that isn't so. The reason is that any other kind of answer would just be unresponsive, it would be question -based. But on the other hand, even if we don't know all of the history ahead of time, even if we don't know all the science ahead of time, the supernatural perspective, the light of faith, gives us the confidence and the fearlessness that no form of truth-seeking is going to turn up something embarrassing for the faith. You know, it's, it would be like a historian who came across a document that suggested that Julius Caesar never lived, right? You know, that historian might have reasons to dig into the surrounding context to figure out why that document is a fraud, but they won't go into it with any real fear. 
that it'll turn out that Caesar didn't exist. Because the, they know, for independent reasons, for sure he did. And I think something like that can be the spirit of, that we have going into these debates. Even if it's going to turn on issues that we haven't uncovered yet in history or science or whatever, we shouldn't have any fear of diving into that if the context calls for it. Because if that discipline is a source of truth and the faith is a source of truth, they're not going to contradict each other. And you can only learn more about one or the other or both by searching. Another thing we get is supernatural motivation and support. The first thing is, I think, you know, it can be very difficult if we don't have a historical sense of this stuff. And we just think about the dynamics of the debate we're currently in. And this is most true of the marriage debate, but I'm told that 30 years ago it was also true of the pro-life issues, that at the time it just seemed like this, this thing was going nowhere, that, you know, Across the board, support for abortion access was the wave of the future. If you were young, you know, if you were against it, it was either because you were old and dying or you had a collar around your neck, and within 20 years it would be over, right? Um, and it can seem, if we look around, like all the smart and beautiful people are against us. And by that I just mean all the elite sectors of culture. Everybody in the universities, for the most part, with very few exceptions, in, in the media, the literati, the, the educated, the chattering classes, right? But if you have the supernatural perspective, you see that you're, that in defending the truth that the church teaches, you're at the end of a parade of heroes, right? Augustine and Aquinas and Anselm and all these fantastic geniuses and saints of Western civilization. And I think it's really important to read them and to, rem to regain that historical perspective and to get the sense that this is very good company to be keeping, and you can gain a kind of encouragement and support and nourishment from that. Um, a very particular suggestion, I think, is to watch A Man for All Seasons. I think of, of all the movies I can think of and that I've seen, that's the one that most shows you how witty, how wily, how graceful, how debonair, how joyful, how free a man can be when he is not his own cause. His cause is something beyond himself. It's remarkably freeing. It's something that you most get in its fullest form only through the perspective of faith. When what you're defending is something so much bigger than yourself that you're willing to die for it, which is not usually true of the secular causes. And that his life, the life of Thomas More, I think is a particularly shining example of the kind of freedom and joy that that can be. I think also we have to get nourishment from believers. I mean, you know, you don't want to just surround yourself by people who, you, who agree with you on everything because you're never going to be tested, you're never going to grow. If you're wrong about something, you're not going to find it out, and so on. But at the same time, there is no substitute for the nourishment and encouragement that you get from the company of believers. It's why Christ founded a church, and there's no substitute for it. And I think the other thing is, Disagreement about ultimate issues, as enjoyable as it can be, as rewarding as it can be to have, the, to duke it out, to have the discussion, it's a consequence of the fall. And it's not the way that we were, it's not what we were made for, and it's not what the kingdom will be like. And the company of the church and, and, and of other believers is important for giving us a taste, a foretaste, I think, of the kind of joy and the kind of peace that we're having all these debates for the sake of. Another thing that I think is that you get with the Christian perspective that you don't have otherwise is a sense of vocation. And by that I mean that, you know, if you're looking at this just from a natural perspective, then the point and the value of all of these really costly debates and discussions is just the value of their concrete effects out there in the world. It's just the number of converts you win to a particular cause. But with a Christian perspective, you know that there is value in the witness for its own sake. And that the value of living out your vocation, of being faithful, is not just the value of your earthly success at it. You know, 
was Mother Teresa, it's often quoted, she said, you know, we're called not to be successful, but to be faithful. And one thing we have been guaranteed by the faith is that in some ways, faith is the higher form of success to begin with. If we're faithful to our vocations, that has effects eternally in a way that far outweighs whatever effects we do or don't achieve in a way that we can see immediately in this life. And then the other thing you get, you have supernatural means, you have a supernatural spirit about it, supernatural motivations and forms of support, this great line of witnesses, this great cloud of witnesses. But I think the other thing you get with the faith is supernatural advice. And I'm thinking of two particular things. One is a command, the other is a prediction that come from our Lord himself. So the prediction is that you won't always convince people. And that's the parable of the sower, right? We all have heard it, the seed, you know, the guy goes out, he's spreading um, the seeds in the garden, some of it falls on the path, some of it on the rocky soil, some on good soil. Some people don't hear it because they're not receptive, some do, but it gets choked by the cares and the anxieties of life, and then some do, but it takes a long time to grow, right? It's soil. It's not an immediate effect. And I think to avoid being discouraged, we have to keep that in mind. Our Lord promised us that if we did everything right, in some cases, it wouldn't bear immediate fruit in the other person, at least. And remembering that can be um, encouraging. And it also gives us the sense that this is a long-term process with lots of factors, and that we plant the seeds, but we don't make the thing grow. The other thing is the command. And by this, I'm thinking of the Great Commission. Um, we all know it. It comes at, after the resurrection, uh, before the ascension, where Jesus says to disciples, go, uh, make disciples of all nations, teaching them all that I have commanded you. And I think this points to a broader goal that you will only have if you're a Catholic in all these discussions and debates, or a Christian in general. You know, the worst goal, the worst motivation to have these debates is just to win, quite apart from whether you persuade someone. And everybody can see that that's selfish and narcissistic and kind of an empty goal anyway. It doesn't really give you the kicks that you're expecting. A slightly more noble but still quite pagan goal is to want to persuade someone. You're not just in it to win, to look good. You really want to change someone's mind. An even more noble goal is to persuade them for the sake of a good cause. So it's not just changing their belief, but it's recruiting them for a worthy enterprise. But I think the only fully Christian goal is not just that you're not going to just win, not just that you want to persuade or that you want to persuade them to a cause, but that you want to persuade them for the sake of a person for the sake of a personal relationship. You're not recruiting them for a cause, but for a communion. And the reason for that is that what the noble pagans couldn't possibly have known, which is that truth, the point of persuasion, is in its fullest form a person. And this is why I'm picking out on, on the word all in the Great Commission. Right? Christ says, teaching them all that I have commanded you. Because I think at the end of the day, are in, although we should always see some form of success, even in fidelity, as we were just saying. The ultimate goal is the most ambitious goal of all, which is to make people Catholic. To make them not just believe by accident in this, or by coincidence in this or that thing that the church also teaches, but to believe in Christ, and therefore in the church he founded, and therefore in all the things that it teaches. To believe that it's a truth-telling kind of thing. And to see that all of that belief is not just an end in itself. It's not just good when people come around on a particular issue for the sake of some intellectual satisfaction. The other thing we see with Christianity is that belief is for the sake of action, and in particular, for the sake of relationship. You know, Christ did not say, I have come to change minds. He said, I've come to make all things do. He didn't say, you know, I've come to persuade. He said, I've come to set fire to the earth. 
So I think all of this should always be, you know, our, we shouldn't settle in our goals, in our hopes, in our prayers, or our friends. We shouldn't settle for anything less than bringing them around, not just to the truth or to a particular cause related to the truth, but to the truth in person, um, to Christ and to the kingdom and to everything that that involves. To see all of these causes and beliefs as being what they are for us, which are effects at the end of the day, downstream, from the one thing necessary, the one thing that really matters, as Christ said to Martha, which is communion with him and through him with 